Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to message number five in this series that I'm calling the morning after, uh, which is talks all about life on planet earth after the rapture. I'm telling you, I hope you're paying attention to this. I hope you are doing everything you can to be prepared to participate in this worldwide phenomenon. It's going to be the most significant event that has happened in the history of the entire world since Jesus was raised from the dead. And, uh, you know, we, we will we will get into talking about this. Hopefully we'll have time. Uh, where we're talking about the significance of the rapture as it relates to the resurrection. You know, there's a lot of people that are very critical of the rapture. Uh, actually, pe people do not understand that the rapture uh, was part of the apostolic doctrine that was taught by the early church, and it was really Catholicism that came out against the teaching of the rapture. Because, you know, the whole idea of the rapture is that God has to deliver the spiritual bride of Christ from the corrupt church and the corrupt religion that is in the world. And the Catholic Church was identified primarily as that corrupt religion. And so in order to, in order to make it where people would not view the Catholic Church as the corrupt religion, they corrupted the doctrine of the rapture. I mean, the Apostle Paul was talking about the rapture all the way back into what we call the Book of Thessalonians. And, and he had taught the rapture to the, to the early churches even before he had written this Book of Thessalonians. So people who think that the rapture is just kind of a, a, a myth an evangelical myth, or that people who think that the rapture is just something that came along uh, uh, in much, much later in church history, you're wrong. The Bible does not bear that out, and the Bible is the book that we go by. It's not, not church history. It doesn't matter what the church did. It doesn't matter what the church uh, uh, acknowledged or didn't acknowledge. What did the Word of God say? And we, and we have types of the rapture as you've already discovered, we have types of the rapture uh, in, in the book of Genesis, and we have prophecies of the rapture all the way, all the way back into the oldest uh, books of the Bible. So anyhow, this is the, the rapture is not a new thing. It is not a pop theology. This is one of the most significant things that we need to believe if we're going to go through what's coming upon the world and be able to have hope in our hearts and uh, trust that God is delivering us. You know, the, the religion wants you to believe that the seven-year tribulation at the end of history is God who gets sick of the world, gets sick of the church, and begins to pour out his wrath. Well, I got news for you. Uh, we are delivered from the wrath of God. The very first doctrine for the foundation of new covenant faith is repentance from dead works. And the second doctrine is faith toward God. Because the Passover, which is the first doctrine established by God through uh, the nation of Israel, the Passover is all about being delivered from wrath by the blood of the Lamb. And I'm telling you what, uh, you do not want to be deceived into thinking that the tribulation is God's wrath. There will be three and a half years of God's wrath, but we will not be here to endure that wrath because we are delivered from wrath. Thank God uh, we are not going to be here on planet Earth. Now, uh, you know, I just want to say this. I'm using the phrase, I'm using the terminology, the morning after, even though you could call it the day after or the week after or whatever, it really, it really doesn't matter exactly what terminology we're using right here. The point is, when the rapture takes place, you don't want to be here. You do not want to be left behind. And one of the things that we will be talking about, and I will be reminding you, is Jesus is coming back, first of all, for those who love his appearing. If you don't want to see him, if you don't love his appearing, I don't know where that puts you 
when Jesus calls the church and says, hey, come, come and meet me. I'm going to deliver you from this. If you don't want to leave, then I don't know that Jesus would force you to leave. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you got to sort that out for yourself. But I'm telling you this, I don't want to be somebody who, who dreads or looks negatively upon Jesus coming to take his bride away. Also, not only, not only is he coming for those who love his appearing, he is coming for those who love the truth. And we'll talk a little bit about this today because the big reason the church and the world does not love the truth is because the world and most of the church loves iniquity or lawlessness. And so much of the 21st century church has rejected uh, God's law as the standards of morals, ethics, and values. I'm not, God's law is not what makes us righteous. The law and the commandments do not make us righteous. Jesus is our righteousness. We are made a righteous in him. But uh, the truth is that righteousness is expressed by the way when we're walking in love, we will fulfill the law and the commandments. That doesn't mean that we replace the law and the commandments with love. It means that love is the only motive that actually aligns itself with the true intentions that God had uh, in giving the law and the commandments. So, so I'm telling you, you can't throw away the law and the commandments. Now, again, you do not want to be in dead works. You don't want to be in religious works. You're not trying to earn anything from God. But if you love the truth, the fruit that's going to grow into your life is going to be you're going to love people and treat people based on what the law and the commandments say is the fair and the honest way to, to treat people. So anyhow, the thing that's going to take the world into the tribulation, the tribulation, according to the word of God, is going to be this, the seven-year tribulation is going to be the worst tribulation the world has seen since uh, creation. I don't know about you, I do not want to be here for that. And one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be a worldwide demon possession that's going to take place uh, after the rapture. It's, it's already mounting now, and it's all based on the love of lawlessness, the rejection of God's word for the uh, for the standard of values, morals, ethics, love, and kindness, and all these kinds of things. It's uh, the rejection of the law and the commandments as God's expression of love is, is really what is taking us to the place where complete wickedness is able to take over the entire world. Now, let me mention this, by the way. Not only do I have great series on the rapture, I've got series on this on the spirit of iniquity. I got all kinds of series. I got thousands of of hours, thousands and thousands of hours of teaching. And the great thing is, uh, this time of the year, we make it possible for you to invest in yourself and invest and invest in your friends. And so, be sure and check out the specials that we have for you. Uh, for those of you who want to buy yourself a Christmas present that invests in your life with God, gives you tools and resources to help you live a more a more victorious life. So be sure and check out any of the subjects that, that you're interested in. We have got phenomenal discounts. And remember, if you are a world changer, some, you're someone who, who supports this ministry financially, not only do you get the special price, but you also get the added world changer discount because we want to say thank you for, for helping us so very much. Now, I want to talk to you just a little bit about this whole concept of worldwide demon possession. You know, the Apostle Paul said something in the book of Ephesians, uh, but I just got to tell you, it, it, uh, it's, it's powerful if we stop and think about it and pay attention to what he says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, and you, he, Jesus, has made alive uh, who were dead in trespasses uh, and in sins. So in Jesus, we have been made alive. In Jesus, uh, we have been born again. Our spirit man has been made alive. We get a new spirit. We get a new heart. 
and uh, and and we actually cease to be slaves to sin. I want you to understand something. You can still sin, but you don't have a sin nature now. If you sin now, it's because you choose to. It's not because you have to. It's not because you have no power. You do have power over sin. Sin is no longer our master. Righteousness is our master if we choose to yield to righteousness. But we can yield to righteousness, we can yield to sin. But we are free from the power of sin. We don't have to uh, be in sin. We don't. We, we are not powerless to sin. We can overcome sin anytime we choose to. But uh, so, so we've been made alive, and uh, because and we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but we're not dead anymore. We have been made alive. He says, "In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience." Now, Paul is saying something in this statement that is so crucially important for us to understand what's happening in the world, what's happening in people who don't know Jesus, what's happening in people who are not born again, but specifically to understand what I'm calling massive worldwide demon possession that's going to happen immediately after the rapture. Now, Paul is saying here that every person who is not born again is actually being influenced and they are walking, in other words, their way of life. And the Bible talks about a path, walking a path. And King James, it uses the word communication. There's several different words that are used that are making reference to a lifestyle, how we live our lives, how we conduct ourselves in general, and he is basically saying that all of us at one point in time walk according to the course of this world, specifically according to the prince of the power of the air. In other words, we were subject to Lucifer because we had a sin nature. Now, we do not have a sin nature. I'm telling you, people will argue with you about this, People will tell you that the reason you sin now is that you have a sin nature. That is not what the Bible says. Go read the book of Romans, plain as the nose on your face. We don't have a sin nature, but we make a choice whether we will yield to sin or whether we will yield to righteousness. So basically, we were all being influenced by the devil all the time that we were giving into sin and all the time that we didn't have the power to overcome sin. Now, he goes on to say, he says, he says, so, you know, you're walking according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power there. Now, listen, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So he is saying all of the children of disobedience, all of those who are choosing to yield to sin. All those who are choosing to give in to the depravity that's in the world are, in fact, uh, operating because they are being influenced by a spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. So basically, everybody that comes to the Lord prior to coming to the Lord, in a certain, very certain sense, are what the Bible would actually call demon possessed. Now, one of the things that we've one of the things that we've got to come to grips with, uh, man, there are so many practices that we participate in, so many ceremonies and rituals in the church, and there's so, so many terminologies that we use that are not scriptural at all, but they have they have been observed for so many hundreds of years that people will fight you over this stuff. And, and, and so in order for us to understand how there's going to be worldwide demon possession, if you will, we have to kind of even look at the world, at the word, excuse me, possessed as it is in the New Testament. You know, uh, Matthew 4.24 talks about Jesus, how that his fame went throughout Syria and and they brought unto him all that were sick and all that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those who were possessed with devils. Now, these two words, taken 
and possess are very, very important words. And he says those that were possessed and those that were taken, that he healed them. Now, when you look at this word possess, here, here, is, here is the shocker. There is no such word as possessed in the Greek language. Now, man, people will fight you over this. I am telling you, Charismatics, Word of Faith, Pentecostals, I mean, people will fight you over this. They'll say, well, Jesus cast out devils. Like, yes, he did. But remember, the word possession or possess is an English word that, and that is a the way that a word has been translated and uh, deliverance is uh, is a word that has been translated, and those words have taken on a life of their own. They mean what they mean to us today, and the meanings of those words are not really based on the meaning of the words used in the original language, and uh, the, the word that is translated as possess basically is the word demonized. Now, what does it mean for somebody to be demonized? Well, this is exactly what Paul was talking about, how that before we got saved, we, you know, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and that is a spirit that worked in us and caused us to be the sons of disobedience. There is the, he, he didn't use the word possess. Just like when it talked about Jesus getting these people delivered, the word possess was not used in the original language. Now, look, I, I've been all over the world. And I've seen what we call demon possession. I've seen it, you know, I have seen it with witch doctors in, in, in the jungles. I have seen it uh, in, in every, every kind of culture in the world. I am not saying that there isn't something where people become influenced and even controlled by uh, demonic spirits. I'm not saying that doesn't exist. I am saying that how we have come to define it and how we have come to understand it is not in a harmony with what the Bible says about it. Because to be demonized is not about a demon taking possession of you. It has no indication of the demon living inside of you as much as it has to do with the fact that you are being influenced, and that ultimately, when you give yourself to that influence, you become taken. Now, not taken forcibly, not taken beyond your control. And, and, and this gets back to one of the most disbelieved and one of the most significant doctrines uh, in the entire Bible. And I'm telling you, it's one of the pillars of faith. And if you don't get this right, your faith will absolutely never be 100% stable. Uh, man was created in the likeness and image of God, and God is sovereign. Now, we again, sovereign is one of those words we have redefined. Religion has made sovereign to say that God is in control of everything, that uh, everything is happening is somehow God's will. And, and that's not what sovereign means. Sovereign basically means that God is not acted upon by an outside source. There is no outside source that forces God or is able to force God to do anything. This means that all the choices that God ever makes, they are made out of his own character. They're made out of who he is. Now, we are created in his likeness and image, and we are sovereign. And by the same token, no one can make us do anything. I mean, we might get intimidated and we might give in to what someone wants us to do. We might give in to, to the fear that we have of the devil or, or, or some entity, but they're not making us do it. They, they do not have the ability. The, a demon does not have the ability to make you do anything. But even beyond that, you have to understand neither God nor the devil can violate your will. Now, you can be influenced, you can be led, there's all kinds of things that can happen, but at the end of the day, if you give yourself, in, if you give in to God, it's because you choose to. If you give in to the devil, it's because you choose to. 
And so this word demonize, which gets translated as possession, uh, basically means you have come under the influence of a demon. Why? Because you have chosen to give into this. Now I'm going to tell you ne next week, and man, I'm telling you, we're going to we're going to do one of the biggest religion buster messages next week that you that you can ever imagine. I'm not going I'm not going to go into it now, but but this is this is all so important if you want to live in in victory. Because if you give in to the devil, you give in because you are getting something you want. See, when we sin, we are always sinning to get something we want. We're sinning uh, as a way to get, get uh, sexual pleasure through immorality. We're sinning to fulfill our greed by being dishonest. We're, we're blowing up our ego by exaggerating ourselves. In other words, we're always fulfilling some lust of the flesh. And the lust of the flesh is where, is where our senses, you know, the lust, taste, touch, smell, uh, uh, sight, hearing. In other words, we've got these natural five senses, and then also we have our ego, uh, and, uh, uh, and, the, and very specifically, very uniquely, the way the lust of the eyes work. Now, lust just means desire. So through these five senses, we have desires. Now, the question is, do we trust God to fulfill our desires in a way that glorifies God, in a way that, that does not take us into self-destruction and immorality and all that kind of stuff? Or do we take the shortcut? Now, when we take the shortcut, we are yielding to sin and we are yielding to unrighteousness. We are yielding to the devil. The devil is not making us yield to him. We are choosing to yield to him as a way to get what we want. Now, the thing that is rushing us forward into the seven-year tribulation is what the Bible calls the, uh, the mystery of iniquity. Now, the Apostle Paul said over in the book of Thessalonians that, that, uh, the, that the mystery of iniquity uh, is at work in the world. Uh, that, that, in fact, uh, it, it has been, uh, uh, by the way, this is Second Thessalonians 2, 7, says, for the mystery of lawlessness, King, New King James says, the King James calls it iniquity, the mystery of lawlessness or iniquity, he says, is already at work in the world. So what is rushing us into the darkest time in the entire world is the fact that people are rejecting the morals, the values, and the standards of God's word. And the biggest thing is we have we have twisted the whole concept of the law and the commandments into something religious, ceremonial, and legalistic. We have, I mean, how many times, and I've even said it back when I was a young preacher. I just said it because I was repeating what other people said. You know, you'll hear people say, you know, the Old Testament is based on fear and legalism. No, it's not. God's always been a faith God, and God's always done everything that he did, you know, based on the motive of love. I mean, listen, it was God who, who, who said in the Old Testament, who said the, the greatest, the most important law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the second one is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so, so we understand that everything about the law and the commandments is telling us how, if we have the intention of walking in love, this is how you do it. You, you don't commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. You don't, you don't lie to people. You don't cheat people. You don't steal from people. You don't commit violence against people. You don't slander people. You don't gossip about people. You know, in other words, all of these are the ways that show us what we should do. You know, you don't bear false witness. You don't testify against somebody to get them in trouble. You don't, you know, you don't sue somebody when you have no right to sue somebody. You don't accuse people of things you shouldn't accuse them of. So the law and the commandments tell us God's standard for walking in love. And the problem is people took the law and the commandments, man did this, God never intended for this. People took the law and the commandments and 
said, this is how we will earn God's approval. No, there's nowhere in the law and the commandments. There's nowhere in the Old Testament that says you can earn righteousness from God. In fact, uh, the, old, the Old Testament, just as much as the New Testament, says that God's a faith God, and, you, and you, can't, you can't please God without faith. Every, matter of fact, it's the Old Testament says that the, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Faith righteousness is not, uh, did not come about in the New Covenant or in the New Testament. Faith righteousness has been a fact that has been present from the beginning of time. We, just, we have just succumbed to uh, the religious nonsense that was taught and that was handed down by the Jews. And I got news for you, all these places where Jesus speaks against commandments and against, against the law in the original language is very clear. He's talking about the oral traditions. He's talking about the Talmud. He's talking about, he's not talking about the law of Moses. He's not talking about the Torah. He is never condemning the law of God. He is condemning the Torah. What leads the world into darkness, and you already see this permeating the church today, is the rejection of the commandments for the, the understanding, the definitions of what love is. And so the more civilization, and not just civilization in general, the church rejects the commandments as these are the standards that we are supposed to live by if we're going to walk in love. That's what Paul was talking about when he says, if you walk in love, you'll fulfill or bring, you know, bring to full expression all the commandments because the commandments were about how to walk in love. But what's happening is we are rejecting God's commandments as the basis for love. We've come up with humanistic, uh, immoral, ungodly ways of defining love. We, we reject God's morals, values, and standards in the name of expressing love. And by such, the world is getting less and less moral, less and less safe, more and more violent. And, and so we are entering into this, this state where people are giving themselves over to be demonized because they want that ungodly version of what walking in love is. They, they, they won't love to be immorality. They won't love to be uh, every, every kind of perver perverted sex, the fulfilling of all greed. They, they, want, they want every sermon to be a prosperity message. They want everything to be about nothing really matters except us just being happy. Well, listen, I got great news for you. We don't have to stay here and see the world dive into that darkness. We can depart meet Jesus in there, and we can escape everything that's coming. All right, be sure and share this with a friend. I'll be talking to you again next week. Don't miss it.